the last speaker, and then we will open up for questions. And all three of the panelists, unless Liz has to fly back to the web, will be uh, will be available to answer your questions. Our last speaker today is Tom Grundy. He represents the group Community Looking at the Impacts of Mine. Of uh, mining. Um, what? Citizens. Citizens. Citizens looking at the impact of mines. And uh, actually, Tom, you can go ahead and, and describe your role in the organization and start your presentation. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jesse. So, um, Claim TV is our group, Citizens Looking at the Impacts of Mining in Grass Valley. Uh, right now, we're looking at one project, one that's been mentioned a little bit, that's been proposed for uh, an area that would be annexed into Grass Valley City limits. That's the other one on mine. Uh, first off, let me start by saying this is not a forum about the pros or cons or merits of that project. This is a forum about what to do when the project is proposed. So we were asked to talk a little bit about uh, what some of the claims chief complaints about that project are. So we just have two slides on that. But again, we're not going to use this as a bullet pulpit because we've had public forums. We've had, we've had definitely one public forum in the past where claim folks and my proponents were both there at the same time to answer questions. So if you have questions about the project, please talk to my proponents as well as to us before you come to any decisions. They're both here. So uh, that hopefully sets the field a little bit, and you know, let's get going. Um, so just a description of the project. Again, if you have any questions, the best folks to talk to are my proponents or actually the paperwork that's been submitted to the city. Uh, the plan is to reopen the Goldrush Bear Hard Rock Gold Mine. I don't know Maryland was the second biggest gold producer in the state. It was opened in 1851 or so and ran continuously through 1956 when the price of gold was being held low. It became uneconomical and closed. Uh, third, the plan going forward is to take 3,600 tons per day out of the ground. 2,400 of that will be uh, processed by uh, uh, gravity as well as what's being called closed circuit cyanide. So this is not an open leaf pit cyanide, but it still does involve cyanide uh, here in Grass Valley. Uh, On-site ceramics factory is also part of the plan, which would process up to 1,800 tons per day and turn it into various ceramic products, tiles, roofing tiles, etc. Um, the plans to sell those we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, waste rock, where would the waste rock go? This is a problem every mining company has, and that's the way it is. Uh, the, problem, the proposals here are it's going to go to a various combination of ceramics factory, backfill, and aggregate. The latest project description has a provision for, I think it's called an operational variability to respond to market demand for those ceramic products and other factors, and to vary the amount of rock that goes to each of those three. Um, three disposal methods. Uh, the process, processing of the rock. In addition to gra gravity, it's going to be an on-site closed-loop cyanide. Uh, it's going to get it up to the quality of gold array and then ship that gold array out for further processing elsewhere. Setting. Uh, the, project, uh, the main project site, there are three project sites. The largest where the actual head train is going to be would be annexed into Grass Valley City limits as part of the plan. So that brings agencies in uh, like LAFCO into this. You have to approve or not the annexation proposal itself. Uh, population of Grass Valley is about 13,000. There are many domestic water wells that are not here when it was operating, uh, when it was last operating up until 1956. Uh, our concerns, just two slides on this. Safety. Um, cyanide being hauled into Grass Valley either by premixed liquid, and I think 9,600 gallon drums on trucks, or a thousand pound, uh, the wording in the, in the project description is 1,000 pound indestructible super sacks. Uh, one, or, one or both of those will be hauled into Grass Valley right, right through the, the freeway events to, to, to uh, downtown, actually. Um, there's no local hazmat team that affects safety response time. That's, that's an issue, not much to do about that. Trucks, traffic, and roads. The plan has uh, up to 220 trucks per day. Um, I think uh, at least 20 times, maybe 40 times. Anyway, to haul out combinations of ceramics, uh, aggregate, you know, uh, for road-based gravel, and uh, also the gold array too. The gold's probably not going to be enough of that to be going on the huge trucks. Um, and in addition to the amount of traffic and safety issues that causes, the road quality. Uh, 
Uh, the mayor of Grass Valley at the time, a couple of years ago, said in quotes flat out on the radio, the roads around here are not designed for this type of heavy traffic. I uh, let's see, water. Dewatering. Uh, before the mining operation can begin at depth, there's going to have to be a lot of water pulled out. Water's been sailing in there since it stopped in 1956, since operation stopped in 1956. Uh, I think the numbers were something like nine months of initial dewatering at a pretty high rate, 1.2 acre feet per day or something like that. Again, I don't have those numbers right here. Please ask uh, uh, the mine folks if you want to see those numbers or take a look at the plane table up front. Um, and then after that initial period, there's of course going to be the maintenance dewatering at a much lower level. Things that could be affected by that, some of the domestic wells could possibly have the water table affected. Uh, many hydrologists have given different viewpoints of well, what could be affected. The predominant one has been the geology around here is so fractured and unpredictable, you could well dewater a whole fact. Say, so, well, that's like 15 miles away away under the Bear River. Well, the operations are planning to go down to, to five or 8,000 feet. I think the latest was 8,000 feet. So that's well, well below sea level. So yes, dewatering on the other side of the Bear River is it's as much a possibility as anything else. There are some low, medium, high risk dewatering zones drawn in the initial map in, uh, in the previous project description. And by the same hydrologists who have pointed out how fractured it is, those have been brought into a serious question. Another question would be watering, uh, scouring and flooding. This is going to be uh, put into two forks of Wolf Creek within the first plan. I think currently it's only going to be put into one fork of Wolf Creek. Uh, the amount of water being put down there above and beyond what's normally in there, um, what happens in the wintertime, and there's going to be higher water levels anyway. What's going to happen to the uh, macro vertebrates, who their habitat is in that creek? Water quality, of course, that's a huge question. What type of water is coming out of there? The initial plan also did not have any provision for water treatment. It was uh, just going to go through a couple of uh, small settling ponds of gravel or, a, or a gravel or sand run, I believe. Again, look at the paperwork. That has been addressed in the second, uh, in the current version of the project description. But again, who can show that that's adequate or not? Acid mine drainage possibility. That's a distinct possibility until there's an um, unbiased PhD who says there's no such possibility of that here, then it remains a possibility. It's been said many, many, many times that this is the uh, uh, Edward Maryland mine is not hydrologically connected to the Empire mine, which has the magenta green, which is loads of news. Um, that is in serious question uh, as to whether or not there's a hydrologic connection there. Uh, here's the overall concern quality of life. What this picture is based on right here is the ceramics factory that built be built on the site. Here's the freeway, uh, Weaver Auto, Hillslap uh, Lumber, Demartini RV. So it's right adjacent to Demartini RV, is where the, the largest product site is. Uh, there's the entering deck. This, this uh, rendering is based on the fact that if you look at the throughput numbers of steam and energy into the ceramics plant, uh, then just based on the volume of the gas, the numbers uh, coming out of each of the six stacks would be a 90 mile an hour jet of steam at 700 CFA. So again, is this possible? Yeah. Is it, can it be shown that it's not possible? No. The timeline, so, so that really addresses pretty much all we're gonna say about the project. Again, this is not a bully pulpit, this is not a forum about the merits of the project. If you want to look into them both, just a final reminder, talk to the mine proponents and talk to us and to look at the things on our table and their table before you make up your mind. The timeline of what our group has done. In 2008, local concern parties started coming together. This was late in game plan. The uh, current that, well at that time, the version of the project description uh, had been put in, I think it was 2005 or six. Uh, and there was, there's still a lot of use of, you know, that in 2006, there was a survey of the residents of Grass Valley that said 72% are in favor of the mine. The rest of that survey says, if all of the environmental concerns can be successfully mitigated, are you in favor of the mine of the Grass Valley? Words to that effect. That first if clause is never really publicized. Uh, in the first draft environmental impact report, there were multiple problems that can Perhaps is actually only the air quality that cannot be successfully mitigated. 
and that was the previous version. The current version has not yet had a draft environment on the back and forth back. Uh, and Center for the Arts in Grass Valley, uh, and it was completely full, 300 people, I believe that's just by donation. But we made sure to invite the mine proponents and some other experts from out of the area, hydrologists from University of Nevada, Reno, another teacher from University of Nevada, Reno, who's, uh, who could also give a little bit of the more pro-mining perspective. Um, we would want to have one of those again, this word that keep going forward. This is not the last forum that would exist on it, so don't, please don't think that. Um, in 2008, the core group start building membership and acquire uh, some grants and legal help. And I want to point out that Sierra Fund was one of the initial startup funders of the group. Uh, that was a big help. There have been others since then. And if we get to the point where it's needed, there will be others again. Uh, 2008, 2009, the actual draft environmental impact report was written and a comment period went on at the end of 2008. Uh, that was a pretty large process of getting people together, breaking down the research into different sections, delegating the responsibilities of who can look at this part, finding local experts to work with it. Talk about that in just a second also. And for the last three years, that's three, right? Yeah, three. Um, it's been wait and see, but that phrase needs to be heavily, heavily qualified. What's the, what does that mean? That means that no new, that there was a new project description by the mine, but there's not been any further action in terms of starting another draft environmental impact report, which would be the next thing to happen in order. So what does wait and see mean in this case? Continue diligence. Uh, continue all the outreach is normal. The meeting presence, strategizing, going to city council meetings when it's appropriate. Watch, uh, you know, keep your finger on the pulse. Watch the agendas like a hawk. Um, watch the press releases. Like anything else. What are some of the strategies we've, we've been using along the line? Collaborating. So where it starts is there's a passionate community. Uh, if there was not a passionate community that wanted to make sure that we're getting the true story, make sure that we're crossing the T's and dotting the I's, and looking into all the details, this would be a lot more difficult. Those people we just talked about of delegating the task of looking into different areas of the research of the draft environmental, environmental impact report so we can comment on it. If there wasn't a passionate community with local experts to look into that, this would be a much different picture. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, local, regional, national experts. We've got a few right here. More than a few right here, as you can tell. So that's a huge benefit. Networking with other experts from different parts of the country to who have looked at issues just like this. Um, however, I want to point out here, if anyone in the group is hoping to get an answer to this question that was brought to the panel, what do you do when a mining project is proposed in your community? This is only our timeline and our strategy. We would not dare uh, want to tell you, think that we have the right to tell you, here's what you do. In fact, a, start, a part of our learning process was uh, reading the history of what had gone on in the system in the first round. And it's, it's unfortunate that uh, they weren't here to be able to speak about that. But that was mine up on the ridge that had its own issues, and a community group got together and gave it the due diligence over a period of time. That was a learning process and an input and a set of suggestions for us. So all we're hoping to give folks on that question now is a set of suggestions, a set of examples of what one group did. I, I would love to hear the same question addressed by the group looking at the pedal. Uh, so we researched. You have to learn project backwards and forwards. That kind of goes without saying, but it does need to be said because you have to look at all places where the project details can be obtained online and through the official routes eventually. The city filings, lead agency in this case, is the city of Grass Valley. So they're filed with the city, they're posted on the city website. Uh, we eventually got them from the city on CD. Uh, make sure you know what you're talking about first. And that's a goal to shoot for. And, and I would never, also never claim to say that uh, any one of us hit that goal 100.0% all the time. But there's always more to learn. Uh, learn the regulatory environment, CEQA, SMARA, learn what you got to work with. This is an interesting one because a lot of people pointed out that in most parts of the world, 
if you were to stand up in opposition to a mine, or even, not even if opposition is not the right word, if you were to stand up and say, we need to give this project a critical, critical review and a really good look through, you'd be shot. And so would your family. So don't take it for granted that we live in the US, and don't take it for granted that we live in California, where we have things like CEQA to protect us, California Environmental Quality Act. Um, there's been a lot of talk every year, and there will be a lot of talk every year at the state politician level of let's just get rid of CEQA. It's in the way. It stands in the way of jobs. So it's here. We need to protect it. We need to learn it and use it. Divide, recruit, and delegate the research task like we were just talking about. The uh, draft environmental impact report, I think, was 700 and something odd pages, and certainly not the biggest draft environmental impact report that you would see uh, for projects like this elsewhere. So definitely have to share that responsibility. One thing was uh, the open uh, comment period, uh, mandated by CEQA, I think it's 45 days. We are, we are able to lobby based on the size of the document to get that up to 90 days. And I don't think there was actually anyone who objected to that. Uh, we made use of it the whole time, and I hope that other agencies made use of it the whole time, too. Some of the other strategies, outreach, of course, to protect and build that passionate community element, local events, farmers markets, county fair, etc. Uh, there have been several other local events, but we've got a table out here. This is to build interest, not just from the local community, but from anyone who's looking into projects like this. Uh, build the awareness so that the passionate community can be empowered to make up the mind, their own mind, so that they can be empowered to actually have the numbers that might not be there from the marketing of the actual company. Post public meetings and potlucks, we've done a good bit of that over the course of time. These are some of the common sense things that if you're going to have a group that's going to really rely on the support of the public, these are the things you have to do to make them. Town hall forums, the panel discussions. Claim has not actually put on a large panel discussion yet, but if it moves forward, there will be one. Uh, media outreach, editorials, letters to the editor, articles, blogs, TV and radio. Uh, pretty much anything you can do to get the word out there because there are a lot of people out there who really want to know about this. There are a lot of people out there who will vote yes because I don't know anything about the project, but my name sounds cool. Actually, at Grass Valley City Council three or four years ago, they were doing interviews to fill a vacant seat. One of the uh, city councilors had to leave. So uh, the interview process, uh, city, the then city councilors asked each of the 11 interviewees uh, one, one of the questions they asked was, what do you think about the Idaho Maryland project? And I remember one of the questions was, I don't really know anything about the project, but I think mining sounds pretty cool. And that's a perfectly valid default answer if you don't know any information about it. So we want to help empower people that want to know that information. And that's about side of it. Um, mailings. Mailings was another We've only done maybe two rounds of those, possibly three. But these are just some of the some of the strategies that everyone has thought of. Agencies, outreach to other agencies. Uh, in some of the other presentations, there have been long lists of agencies that permits are required from. It's not as simple as the city says the the CEQA lead agency says okay, and then the next day a line is open. There's lots of permits that have to be obtained from various agencies. So communicate with those agencies in good faith, raise their awareness, make sure they know what's going on, make sure the draft environmental impact report is up, make sure they know the comment period has begun, make sure they know, hey, here's some of the bullet points of what we think you should be aware of if you weren't already, and give them links to look at for the further details in the documents that have been filed with the city. Uh, Got to play everything above the table, that's what it's about. And we encourage them to comment on the project. So those were some of the techniques. Again, this is just what we did. This is not, we're telling you what to do if there's mine in your community. This is an example, a case study. That's where it is. Um, and just to sum up where the current status of the project is again, is that we're by the second round, we're, well, the 
latest round of project description is now waiting for it, uh, money from the mining company to be paid to the city, and then the city says to the contractor that would write the draft environmental impact report, we will leave. The earliest that potentially could happen is probably 2010-ish, and, and uh, right now, um, well actually, I'm sorry, no, the latest project description was certified by the lead agency by the city in May of 2011. And uh, it's been waiting for that uh, next DEIR to begin for that check to be sent. Since that time, uh, March, middle March of this year, the city uh, gave an ultimate, well, ultimatum is one word to use, a final deadline that if we don't get the check from the mining company within 180 days, we're going to consider the project removed and you have to restart the CEQA procedure from the very minute. Um, so overall, this time that's been happening, you've got to keep your finger on the pulse. Just said we want to tell you what to do. We've been keeping our finger on the pulse, and that's been very, very helpful. That's really where it's at. That is the thing that's been available for you for now. What does that mean? Watching your city council agendas like a hawk. Uh, looking at the local, regional, national media, Google Alerts if, uh, has been a very helpful tool to just tell them what buzzwords do you want to look for on a, on a daily or bi-daily basis of all the things that Google searches for. They'll search through those buzzwords for you, and they'll email you the results however often you want once a day. It was actually Mike Thorne, one of the uh, Sierra Fund folks from a while ago, who suggested that we look into this. This would be good for anything. If you're interested in watching us, this would be great. Google alert. Um, trade, trade magazines, uh, blogs, keep looking at them on the web every once in a while. Emblem website, of course, they're going to post things like press releases, stock prices there. Uh, but don't assume that the stock releases, stock prices and press releases will be posted there. Also take a look at places like Corporate Records for Canada, Cedar, and the Toronto Stock Exchange Venture. That's what PSXV is. And that's, uh, that kind of sums it up. So that's us. If you have any more questions, look at the table up there. And please do make sure to talk to the monitor.